to everyone. We welcome uh, all of you to the Manage Krishi Gandhi Knowledge Lecture Series 30, being conducted today on 31st March 2022. So Manage organizes Krishi Gandhi Knowledge Lecture Series by inviting eminent persons from varied fields of agriculture and development sectors to motivate and inspire the professionals who are working in the de uh, departments of agriculture and other allied sectors and also the faculty members and especially the last mile extension worker. Here we invite outstanding personalities to manage to share their knowledge essence through live lectures to its faculty members, participants of training programs, students and invitees from the leading institutions and uh, uh, networks of manage. These lectures are recorded as video films to share through manage YouTube and other social media so as to reach to a larger audience that includes officers from state departments of agriculture and allied sectors, faculty members of uh, state agricultural universities, samitis, extension education institutes, and uh, uh, Krishi Vigyan Kendras, agripreneurs, non-governmental organizations, and public at large. Today, we are privileged to invite uh, Dr. M. Uh, Vijay Gupta, sir, World Food Prize winner. Welcome, sir. Welcome to the Krishi Gandhi Knowledge Lecture Series. Thank you. Now, I request uh, uh, our beloved Director General, Dr. P. Chandrasekhara, to kindly introduce Dr. <laughs> Vijay Gupta. Good morning to all of you. I would like to welcome every one of you to this uh, talk by Dr. Vijay Gupta. Uh, for a uh, warm welcome to Dr. Vijay Gupta for this very interesting talk on this day. And as my colleague shared with you all, Krishi Gandhip Knowledge Series Lecture he is connecting the last mile extension worker with the best of the best experience available in agricultural extension management. They live in villages, work with farmers, they don't get opportunity to listen to the best professionals in the field. So this is a platform where we connect the last mile extension worker with the, the uh, eminent personalities lifetime experiences. So even though the speaker address limited audience, but later it will be converted into a edited film and it will reach more than a lakh extension workers and institutions, not only within the country, even outside the country. So for this talk today, we have very esteemed speaker, Dr. Uh, M. Vijay Gupta ji uh, to uh, address the audience here. I would like to give a brief introduction of the esteemed speaker. Uh, Dr. Vijay Gupta he is in the field of fisheries research and development for more than six decades. You may wonder, normally people 30 years, 35 years, they serve and they retire. But Vijay Gupta ji dedicated six decades in service of fisheries, not only within the country, more than 20 Asia, Pacific and African countries. He served in very important uh, positions and this great global knowledge he is available to us, all of us today through his talk today. He focused from the beginning on welfare of rural communities through fisheries research and development. And uh, he advocated, you know, through his work that not only it is enhancement of income, but also ensuring the nutritional security to the rural poor by providing, uh, you know, uh, the fisheries as an occupation and uh, the fish as a food. Uh, of course, he initiated the idea of uh, blue revolution and he's the first person to break the yield barriers and doubling production in the field of, you know, the aquaculture. So, uh, he worked in uh, several international organizations, United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Asia Pacific and uh, FAO and 15 international research centers of the consultative group on international agriculture research. It works in several countries and he worked in very responsible positions. But wherever he worked, uh, one thing we can observe that he worked uh, for the welfare of rural communities, 
working at grassroots level in villages in collaboration with some ngos introduced women to aquaculture this is very important we are talking about gender mainstreaming in agriculture and fisheries which resulted not only increased family incomes and better nutrition of millions of families but also led to the empowerment of farm women and gave voice in taking decisions at family level in children education and status in the society so he did not take his entire profession uh, not as uh, generating technologies and disseminating but he ultimately ensured that he reaches the last mile and ensure the welfare of everyone involved in the sector and recognizing his contribution um, he received several awards of course very important award is uh, the sanhak peace prize uh, considered as alternative to nobel peace prize uh, he received that esteemed award and uh, world food prize it is equivalent to nobel prize in food and agriculture uh he received that award 2 trillion meal lifetime achievement award from international union for food science and technology gold medal from the asian fisheries society malaysia and honorary life member award from the world aquaculture society and uh, dr vijay gupta ji uh, is also associated with several international organization uh, like world bank asian development bank uh, undp fao danida Uh, Australian aid, uh, U.S. aid, Commonwealth Secretariat, and uh, of course, Government of India and several state governments. So uh, he is doctorate from uh, University of Calcutta. But what is more interesting, uh, considering his contribution, other two agriculture universities, G.P. Panthagar University, as well as Central Institute of Fisheries Education, they also conferred honorary doctorate. This is uh, in brief about. dr vijay gupta ji uh, vijay gupta ji thank you very much uh, for your valuable time we are eager to listen to you uh, welcome to this uh, krishi gandhi knowledge lecture series talk no thank you dr chandrasekhar for the introduction and good morning to all the listeners who are uh, participating in this program now when i am asked to talk on the uh, translating fish for all interaction extension perspectives and uh, my memories were taken back to the early 2000 when this concept for fish for all was uh, formulated as one of the team members which formulated this concept because at that time large number of studies have been undertaken which showed the consumption of animal protein increases with increase in incomes that means the developed countries were consuming more animal protein as compared to the uh, low income developing country at the same time when we analyzed it what is the contribution of protein from fish as a percentage of the total animal protein which was actually the low income developing countries were more dependent on protein fish protein than the other animal protein so the consumption of fish protein was more in the developing country than to the developed countries that shows the importance of fish in the nutrition security of the people in the low income groups further in spite of the fish being in a, a, a very good resource of essential micronutrients and uh, fatty acids besides the protein the fish was uh, not receiving the attention it deserves in, in in the discussions on food security and nutrition security and policy makers were not aware of the contribution that fish has been making or could make in the lives of the developing people that's why this concept of fish for all was made so that it was looking at how fish can contribute to the food and nutrition security how could it contribute to increase their livelihood how could it lead to a sustainable environment biodiversity conservation and all these things were discussed and we had actually a international conference way back in 2002 which was attended by 300 and 300 participants from 42 countries which endorsed this concept of fish for all and we had an eminent uh, panel of um, steering committee members from all over the world and which was chaired by dr ms swaminathan our uh, green uh, <laughs> revolution uh, father of green revolution in india and in fact dr swaminathan went forward and in 2003 the ms swaminathan research foundation started 
Fish for All Training Center Training School in Nagapatnam in Tamil Nadu district. So I will not go into all the activities that Fish for All has taken up, but look at us what activities need to be uh, discussed from the perspective of fish contributing to the livelihood, food security, and the nutrition security. Now, look at the demand for the fish. Now, globally, it is estimated we need about 30 to 40 million tons of extra fish by 2030 to meet the increasing, the increasing population, urbanization, and increased incomes. When it comes to Indian scenario, the government wants that the fish production should be increased from 14 million tons in 2001, uh, it's a 2020, to 22 million metric tons by 2025. That is a 50% increase in production. How do we increase this production? Because for fish production, we have two resources, one from the captured fish, that is catching from the wild, from the rivers, and from the seas, and also aquaculture or the farming of fish, like the agriculture. If we look at this captured fishery that is from the seas and the river, the productivity has gone down because of overexploitation and various environmental issues. So the entire world, not only India, is depending on aquaculture or farming of fish to meet the increasing demand of the, its population. Now, how are we going to increase the production? There are two ways of doing that one. One is called is a horizontal expansion, that is bringing the unutilized, underutilized land resources, water resources, and the production to increasing the productivity per hectare. That is the vertical expansion that we are looking at. So, government of India has taken a large number of because we have a large number of resources that are underutilized or unutilized, for example, is the reservoirs. Now, government has a very big program of establishing cages in the reservoirs and increasing the productivity. So that is way, one way of utilizing, underutilizing the uh, resource. In. Second, second, we are looking at the increase in the productivity of from aquaculture. If we look at the government statistic, it shows per, per hectare production of fish from farming is only three tons per hectare. While the technologies are available to have a production of 20 to 30 tons per hectare, and some farmers are producing 10, 20 tons per hectare, our average is only 3 tons per hectare. That means some of the small scale farmers are producing even less than 2 tons per hectare. So, as we all know, that 80% of the farmers in India are small scale farmers. So where should be our focus? Is it increasing the productivity by the larger scale farmer or upgrading the uh, productivity of the small scale farmer, which form 80% of the, our total uh, farmer population? So we let us look at it at the small scale farmers where they need more attention and more assistance. So, so generally when a large number of technologies are available for small scale farmers and also for large scale farmers. Large scale farmers are less dependent on extension activities as compared to the small scale farmers because they don't have access to the information technology, access to the resources, access to the finances. So let us talk about the extension needs of the small scale farmer so that they will be able to contribute to the increase of production in India at the same time improve their nutritional status. Generally, we are three ways of extension methodologies that normally follow. One is training, two is a demonstration, and third is the publicity of technological information. These are the three general information that we are doing in that term. So let us see these three extension methodologies, how efficient we have been or we need to be in the future. Now, let us go to the training programs. First, let's study. Let us go to the robustness of technology. Quite often, there is a difference between the research pe people and the, uh, the extension people. Extension people believe the technology is developed at the research institution may not be suitable under farmers' condition. So they are sitting in ivory towers and formulating the technology. So one of the things that we have been doing in my early stages of work, working in, in developed countries is, okay, we have the major technology that is available, but we have adopted to the needs of the farming community wherever it is. One size fits all will not work. So we have to look at the needs of the farming community in different parts of the country 
and different sta uh, status of the farmers. So I give an example. While working in Bangladesh in 1980s, so as I said, as uh, Dr. Chandrasekhar was telling, my all my life has been spent with the small scale farmer. So we were looking at most ex expense of the small scale uh, ponds and the ditches were available, which were lying fallow. So how to bring these small scale farmers into the whole of fish farming, improve their nutrition and improve their incomes? So we know the technology, but we wanted to know what are their problems, what are their experience in fish farming? So I joined my hands with a non-governmental organization, went to the villages, brought the groups of farmers together and explained to them, see, this is the technology that we have that may be suitable for you. Then they gave a feedback to us, some of the species that you're asking me to consider, we are not interested because that has no market demand. Because as a scientist, we are talking about 10 tons, 20 tons per hectare. But as a farmer, he's not looking at tons, but he's looking at how much profit he can make. So he, they suggested some changes in terms of the fish species combinations and in terms of use of the inputs that are needed. So we modified these technologies to suit their needs and started demonstrating in village level. So again here, one misconcept is Demonstration means we always give subsidies to the farmers. Free inputs are given, the researchers go to them and handhold them all through the time, and that is giving rotten. So here what we said to the farmers, the technology is robust, we are sure you'll make a profit. So we don't give any subsidies. What we will arrange is we'll ensure that you get the needed uh, financial assistance as a loans and also ensure available needed inputs are available in time to you. So some of these NGOs came forward and they were charging, don't believe me, the 21 to 22% interest per annum as compared to eight to 9% from the banks. In spite of this, these small resource poor farmers were taking from the NGOs because they were sure if a loan is coming without any collateral that the technology is robust and that has been able to do. So we went initially to the few villages, not demonstrating one or two places, but a group of farmers were taken. And within one year, they could see the uh, change in their production levels and incomes they got. So at the same time, what we did was that part of the income they are generating, they had to put in a savings account so that once the loan is stopped after one year, they will be able to continue the technology that has been demonstrated to them during the second year. So this is where we have to uh, tailor the technologies to needs of the farmer community, reason wise. For example, the needs of farmers in Andhra Pradesh is something different of the needs of farmers in Northeastern states, where there is a high demand for fish and also the high, very uh, large resources are available, but the technological transformation is not there. So we have to look at this technological uh, innovation that we need to undertake that one. Second thing that we always forget about it is availability of inputs to the small scale farmers in time. And inputs, I mean, by uh, means by fingerlings, the baby fish, the fertilizers, the fish, and all these things. As an extension work, I will tell what is the technology, but I will not ensure that the farmers in getting the access to the inputs. So again, I, 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 I tell an example while working in Thailand, we were working in the rural part of Thailand, where the research poor farmers, the small scale farmer, if they have wanted the fingerlings of the baby fish, they have to travel to 30 to 40 kilometers to the nearby hatchery. And they were not willing to waste one day for that because of that other pre occupation. So what we did is all the small scale farmers were giving the, their indent for the requirements, how many fingerlings, what species they want to the local fisheries officer. The fisheries officer were grouping them all the requirements together and bringing from the hatchery. And on a particular day, he was announcing to the farmer that fingerlings will be available from the fisheries office. And again, that has made a change. So this is one of the problems that we have been facing in the India. For example, going to the 1970s and 1980s, what we call as a composite fish culture or polyculture, the researcher has shown that seven species of fish culture together, can fully utilize the, all the natural feed 
uh, in the phone and increase the production. But the farmers have been facing problems and getting at the, sa at the same time seven types of species. So that was not successful. Second, when we talked about seven species cultured together, we were looking at highest productions of five to 10 tons per hectare. But somehow these species have, doesn't didn't have the market value. They were not getting a high price in the market. So the farmers were telling, we are not interested in cultivating those species, which does not, they may grow faster, but not, does not have any high market value. So these farmers in Andhra Pradesh have changed their, adopted this technology, focusing at the market requirements and people's food habits. So we need to tailor these technologies as per the needs of the demonstration. And again, the, when you count of the demonstration that we do it, we are giving the inputs to them. And that gives a wrong signal to the neighboring farmers. This farmer who has been getting the, all the inputs as subsidies or free inputs from the demonstration, from the research institutions or from the state government or under the government, the central government program, were able to do this practice that for uh, culture because of all the subsidies and coming to be there and giving a wrong signal to the other farmer. I tell, I tell you an example, in one of the countries I have been working in a crop sector, two different agencies have been demonstrating a particular crop technology. Different technologies, but the same type of crop. So we asked the neighboring farmers, which technology you like, which demonstration you like. He said that particular demonstration we like. I said, why do you like that demonstration? Because that farmer is getting more subsidies and more inputs from the agencies. Second, we also, when they are showing high productions, why are you not following those uh, technology? He said, if I get also the subsidies and in free inputs from the government, I will also practice. So that gives an a wrong impression that the farmers are able to get higher production because of subsidies and so subsidies are necessary, but to a limited extent, and we have to be very, very careful on that. Now, coming to the training programs, it's a common everywhere in all the countries, wherever, whenever a technology has been developed, we organize in training programs for the transfer of the technologies. Quite often, the efficiency of an institution is measured by the number of people they have been trained. But I find a lacuna in that before organizing a training program, no one undertakes a needs assessment of the trainees that they have selected. What type of trainees that you are doing that one? What are their needs? What are their resources? What type of technology that they need to be trained? And that is not being done. Now, after the training is done, no assessment, what has been the impact of the training? How many trainees have really adopted the technology in which they have been trained? So that is also not being trained. In, in fact, I sometimes I think lots of the training programs are going wasted because there is not much of an adoption. Now we have also been talking with training of the trainers, the extension workers. Recently, I was um, evaluating the performance of one of the fisheries universities. We were looking at the number of graduates that have come from the graduated, undergraduate, and postgraduates that have come out. How many have really gone into the fisheries sector as entrepreneurs? But the number of people who have been graduated from the universities going into the fisheries sector have been very few. So all the investments that have been made in training these people are going waste. The second thing that I find is most of the trainings are theoretical, very little of a practical knowledge in that one. The trainers themselves doesn't have the confidence in the technologies because they didn't have the practical experiences of uh, implementing this technology. So we need to ensure more of a practical training, both to the training of the trainers and also the farmers. Unless that is done, unless we uh, create a confidence in the farmers of the, the training that is being given, it will not be successful. So what we have been doing in all these countries, some of the countries where I worked was that, all these training programs are not centralized go to different regions, organizing in the farmer's ponds. Demonstrations are given by the successful farmers, not by the extension agents. And we make the successful mark farmers to talk to the trainees so that they will be able to take the tell the, their experiences, how they progress in the technology implementation, 
what are the problems that they encountered and how these problems are resolved. Quite often when we take a transfer of technology, we always take the positive aspect, but we don't highlight the likely problems in implementation of the technology. I take a classical example when I started this aquaculture way back in 1970, when the technology was developed three, at that time, 3.5 tons per hectare was the highest uh, fish production from the research institutions. We were asked to go to the state government farms and demonstrate it. And I was a new to aquaculture at that time, frankly. So I went to the farmers and started in, that was in West Bengal, started talking to the farmers because they have lots of experience, you know, they are doing the fish culture for decades together. They know the potential, they know the problems also there. So I explained the, the technology, you can get five tons, six tons per hectare for doing this and that. So he was an uneducated, but a very experienced farmer, very nice and polite. Simply he questioned, uh, one, sir, I will ask one question. If you don't mind, can you respond? I said, fine, please ask me. He said, what is your salary? I said, so much. So multiplied by 12, so this is annual salary. Sir, you are telling me by one hectare, you can make so much of so many lakhs of profit, but your salary is only this much. Why are you not interacting with the fish farmer instead of going around the farms in this hot sun? I'm willing to share one of my one or two hectares of bonds to you. Why don't you do that? Sir, so that I you now I take him as my guru actually. He taught me, you know, the practical aspects of extension. He was very nice. Uh, and but I benefited from his traditional knowledge and he benefited from my scientific background when, when we worked together. Even now I consider him as my guru in this uh, sector. I always quote him. Uh, uh, what he has done to me and what uh, he taught me. So these are some of the practical things that we need to follow that one because lots of programs are very good in paper, but they have been failing when it goes to the field level implementation. Then another thing, quite often we don't meet the market requirements because again, as scientists, we are talking about production patterns or potentials per hectare. What is the market demand, whether there is a market demand for that species or not? I, I, I tell one of the research institutions in, in India has developed a technology for a particular species of plant that is very good, high production and sustainable. But the farmers have found the market value for that product is very low and they will not be able to make any profit. So we have to be very careful in uh, um, selecting and disseminating the technology to the farmers. So when you are looking from the food security and uh, nutrition security, increase in production by itself will not be able to resolve the issue of food security and nutrition security. We need access to the food, right? This should be affordable and easily available. So for that, we need to bring awareness because the government statistics shows that per capita consumption of fish in India is only seven to nine kilograms per person per year, as compared to the world average of 23 kilograms uh, per person per area. But in a big country like India with the different uh, uh, you know, food habits, I don't take average as a good uh, indication of, of that one. So the government of India now wants to double the intake from double the per capita consumption of fish by year 2025. How do we do that? So we need to bring awareness among the population of the health benefits of fish so that they move from red meat to the uh, light meat like fish as is being uh, suggested by the WHO and other international organization. And also making available the fish in under hygienic conditions. If you look how the fish is being sold in the market, I don't feel like buying the fish because on the weekends you can see the fish being sold even in big city like Hyderabad on the roadside under hygienic conditions. Unless we improve the marketing infrastructure and bring the fish being sold under, under hygienic conditions, people will not be able to increase their consumption. I always compare how the uh, increase in uh, chicken consumption, 
has increased. Production and consumption has increased because in the earliest stage, days, you have to buy more chicken from the market. You have to defeather them and clean them and all those things. Those things. But now everything is available. You have to you have the roast, you have the legs, everything like that in a clean form so that all the people are able to increase the production. So we need to bring the technology to that level so that fish is available to the farmers. The other aspect that we were looking at was the involvement of the women. If you look at the processing industry in the value chain, 50% of the people involved in the value chain are the women, actually. So we were looking in the developing countries, one farmer earned by agriculture or other occupation and is a family of six to seven members, which will not be sustainable. So we were looking at in different countries how to make the women as entrepreneurs. So we started motivating them and then training them and getting them loans from other banks or other agencies and started producing the fish. First, we gave a small scale uh, farming method where there is a low risk, of course, low profit. But once they were successful in that, they moved to a high risk, high profit technologies. So at one time, when I was working in Bangladesh, after all our efforts so about seven to eight years, we found nearly 50% of the farmers are women. So that has led to women and uh, entrepreneurship and also women empowerment. Till then, women did not have any voice within the family. It was the man because he is the elder. He was taking all the decision, not only in terms of spending the earning, but also in running the family. But once the woman has become an earning member, he had a voice within the family and within the also in, uh, status in the society. And we have analyzed this when women have started concern what a difference that have made. And in fact, we have seen unforeseen changes in the family. Before that, a child, when he becomes 10 to 12 years, the father was taking the child to the agriculture field to work as a laborer, as an additional hand. But the month the woman has become an earning member through aquaculture, she said, no, I won't send my child to the field to work as a laborer, but I will send him to the school. So she didn't want the child to follow the same uh, labor slavery, but she wanted the child to be educated. So, so we were looking at the how to enterprising women. So value addition, lots of technologies are available for value addition undertaken by the ICR Institute, like the Central Institute of Fisheries Technology. So in a, at a small scale, in the village level or in urban level, these small scale technologies can be utilized for value addition of products like pickles and chutneys and things like that, and can also be developed. So these are various methods that we need to follow in making the fish available to the consumer in hygienic condition at affordable prices and so that we could increase the nutrition status of the population. I open for any questions that you'd like to ask. It is open for discussion. So any uh, clarifications by participants? So that is one thing, sir, Dr. Chandrasekhar always bothers me. We always say we are the third largest producer of fish in the world and second largest producer of fish in the aquaculture producer in the world after to China. But China produces about 60 million tons of fish. We are Through aquaculture, we are producing only one-tenth of what China produces. We have same source of aquatic resources what China has, and we have the same resources in India. The technology transfer has to relocate to the way that we are transferring the technologies to the end users. Absolutely, sir. We agree, and uh, we all aware compared to any other sector. For example, if you take agriculture, horticulture, and husbandry, maybe fishery has the weakest extension uh, system. So hardly we have uh, one or two extension functionaries in a district. So uh, absolutely, it is uh, impossible for him to reach uh, every fisherman. So the way you have shown especially working with the private sector, working with the NGOs, it is one of the important to take away for us. So I think we have the need to join, sir. We used to join our hands with agriculture extension people because there are some technologies where rice farming can be integrated with uh, fish culture 
where poultry farming can be integrated with fish culture. So, in a small in a small area, an extension should extension should have a basic knowledge along with agriculture, livestock, and the fisheries. In a small scale uh, farmer, we are talking integrated farming. You know, he has to raise uh, raise the poultry or the livestock and do undertake the crop culture, vegetable farming, and all that. If we expect a small scale farmers have the knowledge of all this in information, why not a basic extension worker should have the basic knowledge of disseminating this information? If specialist information is needed, they can refer it to the specialist uh, 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 fisheries extension worker. So we have to look at in one of the countries actually, we went and looked at the extension uh, wing. What are they supposed to be doing? And in their constitution, it was written that an extension worker is being trained. He should be trained in agriculture, horticulture, crop, uh, uh, poultry, and also fisheries. He should have a basic knowledge of everything when he is approaching the farm. But here we have our compartmentalized. We have an agriculture extension officer, we have fisheries, we have a livestock officer who don't want to talk to each other. So with the limited resources, how can we? So the other thing that we are looking at, farmer to farmer extension. So we were, once a farmer has been trained, he is able to understand and uh, get profit from the technology. We have been encouraging that farmer to be a trainer to other neighboring farmers. So the farmer to farmer extension is a much a better way to proven technology because a farmer, when he hears from another farmer of his success story, he believes much that farmer than listening to an extension worker who is more a theoretician rather than a practitioner. So this is something that we have to explore the various ways of uh, transferring the uh, knowledge to the end users of the farmers and the food. Very right, sir. In fact, the latest emergence of farmers producers organizations. Yes. Maybe yes. fisherman uh, group. Uh, so that kind of groups are promoted. Maybe um, extending extension services to group will become more easy compared to individual farmers. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Plus, the, plus the private sector involvement, NGOs under these lead farmers, yes. they can play a very important role. And in fact, we are looking at because there are uh, large areas unutilized government lands or how to bring the landless people into the farming actually. So what we did in some of the countries was this large uh, unutilized government lands or even private uh, lands were taken on lease with the backing of an NGO. He was NGO was, you know, standing behind the farmers as a group. And though they were leasing these uh, water bodies for three to four years, and the collator was the NGOs, because NGOs were sure that these farmer groups will be able to deliver the um, uh, product and also make a benefit. So in fact, a larger number of farmers, especially this has been very successful in Bangladesh. And I'm proud to be saying that in Bangladesh is much at advanced than India in aquaculture, let me say. But having worked there for 10 years, in the beginning of the record of their evaluation, so that's where the farmers have taken a very big role. They don't have very big extra research institutions. They don't have very big extension wing. But it's the farmers of farmer and the non-organized sector that has provided uh, inputs, supplies, motivation, training that has taken place. That's where we have to look, I think, in, a little bit away from the traditional way of doing the extension, and we have to be more innovative, I think, probably, how to reach to the farmers in that way. Uh, good morning, sir. Yeah. Sir, good morning. Uh, this is Dr. Yeah. Malibabu. I am Professor and HOD, College of Agriculture, Rajendra Nagar, sir. Yes. Actually, I have one uh, very hour. I wanted to, you know, tell you the my opinion, having uh, served with the farmers closely for many years. Actually, yeah. in Indian conditions, as you said, when compared to other countries, our farmers who is innovative, doing something good, or innovative technology and whatever it is there, he is not readily come forward to share as quickly as other countries we have seen, as per the experience, sir. Yeah. But uh, this can be addressed, uh, do you, if you think that this can be addressed through uh, developing an uh, innovative farmers network or key communicators network in a bigger way that yeah, may be yeah. possible. <clears throat> sure, sure, sir. Uh, uh, and in fact, as you have said, rightly said, sir, some of the farmers in agriculture, I tell you, have been their innovators actually. 
in some cases i see they have done much work than a research institution they are practical oriented you know they are looking for the market demand they are looking what research they have what are the risks are involved so uh, i always change the farmers in andhra pradesh they are not farmers they are entrepreneurs some of them are doctors or lawyers post graduate uh, students that have become a farmer and they have been very because they were able to take the risk because they are rich they made the money already so they have been very innovative i should say so so researchers can join hands with this enterprising farmer innovative farmer and they are joined it and put together i am sure there are number of innovative farmers in other present who are willing to share their knowledge to other small scale farmers so so what i would suggest you know when an extension say for example in north east where the knowledge of the farmers is very low okay the demand is very high why not take farmers from the andhra pradesh or any state where there is have been innovative and use them as research extension agents there teaching training let those farmers talk to those farmers they tell what are the pros and cons of the technology what are the profits they can make what are the problems that they may encounter how they have resolved it that will be much better than me or you going and talking to the farmers the white collar people they will, will not believe it so Thanks. we have to create confidence in the farmers that what we are talking is realistic and really they can follow that one sir we have a very interesting concept in uh, atma program yes of course uh, that is yet to become uh, popular but the conceptually it is very very good the concept is a farm school concept yes where the progressive farmer field itself is a demonstration unit the yes. progressive farmer himself is a teacher yes and only, only the farmers living in the same village are the students yes so technical backstopping is given to this uh, farm school uh, owner that is progressive farmer yes and yes. whenever critical activities are carried out the neighboring uh, farmers are called to his field they will come by walk they yes. they need not travel and those practices which are successful in his field and easily they can be adopted and they will be successful in other yes. really this is very good sir but uh, for spreading this concept yeah it is taking more time even though schematically provision is made in atma scheme we are supposed to promote two farm schools in every block in the country per year yes sir i have one query sir i am currently working in national dairy research institute Yes, uh, Karnal, Karnal, Haryana. Okay. Uh, what I have seen earlier, I worked in uh, Siva Chennai, sir, practice water agriculture. Um, so my query is uh, one is my observation is um, in general the fish farmers or aqua farmers are more connected uh, through association with each other as compared to other sector like animal husbandry where it is uh, uh, it was not that much. That is my observation. I have one query, sir. Uh, just it is interviewing for a long time. Uh, yeah. 20 years back, uh, people say that uh, India can maximum produce 14 million tons of fish production. Um, yeah. Somewhere in 2000, 2020, um, uh, up to even 2010. Then yeah. later, uh, people revised it to even um, 20, 22 million tons uh, we can produce. Yeah. But uh, resources are same. How they uh, revised this uh, target to that much extent? Uh, when earlier it was told only this much from marine, this much from inland. Uh, so maximum 14 million tons india can produce uh, yeah so my response will be that as i said yeah explore, uh, explore exploring from 14 million tons to 22 million tons by year 2025 it is a within a span of 5 years time so the concept was the average production now is 3 tons per hectare which is through proper extension proper dissemination of technologies and availability making available the needed input we should increase the per hectare production from 3 tons to 5 hectare per 5 tons per hectare that is the projection okay and also bringing some of the underutilized unutilized resources under equipment for example lot of uh, emphasis is being made for example in the case of the fresh water pension utilization of reservoirs through cage farming recirculatory aquaculture system bioflock and things like that so one thing is i i interact with some of the farmer they said okay sir you are telling to increase the production we are willing to increase the production but where are the markets they have been quoting as some real examples okay when 
you see the pangasius production was a catfish farming that uh, they went up to 20 to 30 tons per hectare the market was flooded there was no buyer the price came down and they were in loss so he said now we are not going to increase the production to 20 to 30 tons we are able to make more profit by limiting our production to 10 tons per hectare. So at the same time with increase of production, we have to also look at to increase the consumption. That's what we are talking about. Because our consumption levels are very low. Unless we increase the domestic demand. So whatever the programs you take up or increase the production, it will not be sustainable because there is no market for that. So simultaneously with increasing the production, we also look at increasing the consumption through bringing awareness, increasing, improving the quality of products to the consumer, look at the markets and marketing, and also the value addition to the pro uh, product. So it's a whole circle we have to look at it. Just asking a farmer to increase the production will not do that unless he has a market for that, his product. Sir, uh, so that, sir. yeah. Yeah, sir, uh, myself, uh, Dr. Sudharani, sir, uh, Director yeah. Extension. Uh, PJTSU, Professor Jay Shankar Telangana Agriculture University. Okay, nice uh, as such, uh, what I feel is uh, the way we look at uh, Fisher farmer uh, as separate. So let us look at him as a farmer cultivating land and also interested to go for uh, fish production. And uh, this was actually felt, now it is being felt in our state also uh, because of uh, the what you call increased area under irrigation through various projects and all. In the tail enders, definitely they have the problem of submergence where we can think of having the fish based integrated farming. Yeah. Where we can go for paddy and fish. This yeah. is what actually we want to plan and uh, what you call uh, go for the fish production. And we and especially in the system that we have here, the Krishi Vignana Kendras. Uh, now they have uh, in these. Uh, uh, Kendras, uh, fisheries is also one of the important uh, aspect wherein yeah. with the under Narega, uh, whatever the land, the instructional farms that are there. So they are asked to have the fish ponds and demonstrate to the farmers. That is uh, one aspect. So wherever, as you rightly said, the wastelands are there, we can go for uh, uh, these uh, fish ponds and then uh, fish production. So now agriculture extension definitely is being looked through a different uh, dimension, including uh, fisheries also. So we have under uh, one uh, subject matter specialist uh, meant for uh, uh, the fisheries along with animal husbandry. So now slowly things are changing. But one thing is we do not have a successful um, uh, aquaculture based IFS, which can be uh, followed by small and marginal farmers who are doing agriculture also. So once such models come, no, definitely we can uh, scale them up across the country uh, through different extension agencies. Uh, oh, it's, a, it's a very good point that you are raising, Madam, that integrating aquaculture and agriculture. I will tell you an example. This is what we are facing in the 1980s and 1990s in Bangladesh. There are some low-lying low areas where there were long stemmed rice, they were growing that one. We are looking at integrating fish culture. At the same time, agriculture crop protection people were advising the farmer not to use too many pesticides. But the farmers were not following the advice of the uh, uh, extension agents because they were afraid the pesticides are used or not used, their crop may be damaged. That's where we joined what we call the farmers' schools. Bringing the farmers together, we introduce a fish into the rice farms. When the fish is there in the rice farms, the farmers are thinking twice before putting a pesticide. And our observation of a larger number of farms that we have observed, that integrating aquaculture with rice farming has reduced the use of pesticides, has reduced the use of uh, fertilizers, and also increase the production. In fact, I have written two books on that integrating agriculture and aquaculture based on experiences and also review of the, uh, throughout the uh, world. And this integrating aquaculture with agriculture is resulting in increased rice production by eight to 9% and decreasing the cost of rice production by about 10%. Because when the fish is there in the rice field, for eating the insects that are in the soil, they will be disturbing the soil, thereby releasing the oxygen and also releasing the fertilizations to the plant. So the 
rice yields have gone up and cost of uh, production has come down. So there are multiple benefits of increasing the soil, uh, increasing the integrating the aquaculture and agriculture. Sir, uh, uh, in drylands, drylands can farmers be brought into fishery sector, sir, with uh, small aqua systems uh, which they can create. So how 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 can we promote fisheries in uh, dryland sector, sir? That is. Uh, uh, dryland sector is difficult, but that we have been talking about even you know, small scale farming can be done even on the rooftops, like you know, terrace uh, gardening and things like that. Small fabricated tanks can be utilized, you know, where the water can be pumped from there. But the opportunities and, and other problems will be much more than in the dryland, anyway, because water is the main need resource needed for aqua farming. If that is not there, and the aquaculture cannot be taken. Yeah. But actually. Uh... Just uh, before uh, Dr. Jaya concluding, uh, I just recall, sir, in uh, agriculture extension course, first day, they used to quote a Chinese pre proverb, don't give fish to the farmers, <laughs> teach him fishing. So exactly. you, you very aptly, you put it, no subsidy, but empowerment. I we really like it, sir. Even though that is a very difficult journey, but that is only a sustainable part. Uh, right. Yes. Yeah. No, initially we had to put a little more effort in disseminating the technology. Once the, the technology demonstration has been successful, I, the role of the extension worker will be less and less, you know, that uh, technology is disseminated to farmer to farmer. So in my days when we are talking about, as I said, there is a lot, there's a disbelief between the researcher and the extension worker because Researcher always blame the extension worker is not doing enough to take the technology to the farmer. And the extension worker used to blame the researcher. These people are sitting in ivory towers under ideal conditions where all the inputs are there, what resources are available at the time and coming with the technology, but it's not workable. So what we were calling as at the time was on-form research. So you may have the basic knowledge of a technology, then go and work with the on the farms with the farmers. So if the technology works, it's a wonderful 100% transformative technology. And while doing that, we will also know the what are the constraints in implementation of this technology. This is something that we have followed in some of the uh, countries where I work. In fact, uh, uh, my bosses have questioned me, Gupta, you're a researcher, a researcher, but you're doing more of a demonstration. I said, where is the demonstration, where is the research, what is the cutoff between them? So when researchers, as it happens, his efficiency is estimated by the number of publications, but not the adoption of the technologies as it developed. <laughs> what is the use of a technology that is not adopted by the farmer? In my opinion, you call it as a technology when it is adopted. When it is not adopted means there are some constraints in various ways. So then it's not a technology, it is not adoptable. So for whom are we developing this technology if it is not adopted? So I always tell my colleagues, call it a technology once you have verified under farmer's conditions and it is successful, call it as a technology and start it disseminating that way. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much uh, for a very enlightening session uh, on uh, increasing the food production. You talked about uh, horizontal expansion and uh, increasing the productivity uh, in uh, vertical expansion. And also, sir, uh, uh, you talked about uh, different uh, methods of uh, uh, research that has, that has been conducted already. Uh, and then uh, how you can help the farmers uh, in increasing the feed pro fish production that you narrated, sir. And about uh, Government of India um, wants to double the consumption of fish in the country. By 2025, you have suggested uh, very practical measures uh, that is about farmer to farmer extension and uh, developing more linkages among the extension service provider service providers from different departments uh, like agriculture animal husbandry fisheries and other uh, departments and uh, how we can motivate and train the farmers and finally uh, you have suggested that uh, we can transform uh, the practicing uh, fish farmers as researchers and extensionists so that other farmers get trained and then uh, uh, they, uh, they also get benefited from the research uh, that these practicing farmers have done. 
So thank you so much, sir. It was a very, very enriching session for us. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank, you, you sir. Okay. thank you on behalf of managed family again, sir. And uh, of course, very important takeaways. Uh, telling people what not to do is also very important. Normally in extension, we are not you emphasized on that, but very interesting example which you quoted, accepting West Bengal uh, farmer as guru after that questioning, uh, it is an eye opener for us. Mm -hmm. Sir, you are uh, through your life experiences, you really enlightened us and gave very valuable lessons in uh, uh, extension. Uh, thank you very much, sir, for sparing your time. We are yeah. grateful. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you.